Okay, we are recording. Thank you for your patience. I just want to make sure. Are we sharing on the screen there? Why we do what we do? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, you'd think we have it down much smoother by now. That, I think if that's as smooth as I'm going to be able to get it. But great to see everyone. Again, we're going through this series, why we do what we do. So I have a question for you to start. Actually, before we do the question, just to give you an idea of where we're at in this series, we're halfway through. Um, I've particularly enjoyed this series, why we do what we do here at Fifth Avenue Chapel. Um, and, and a lot of this, it's a reminder, we're getting back to the word. We, we need to be looking into the word and, and allow the word of God to direct why we practice uh, what we do and how we practice. And, and there's a lot of freedom. And we are going to talk about traditions at the end. But I've particularly enjoyed this. And today, we're going to be speaking. We're going to be looking into the idea of spiritual gifts. So it is going to be very informative today. I, I definitely want to present some personal challenges. I want to make sure that it's applicable to us, but it will be very informative. And it's a lot of information. So I apologize ahead of time. Lisa told me, Jim, slow down. You tend to rush. And um, I probably will be rushing, but all of this will be recorded. And I'm happy to share my PowerPoint. So my notes, that really, the idea is we want to get a conversation going. We're not going to be able to cover everything here in 40 minutes, but at least to get us thinking about some of these things when it comes to spiritual gifts and what does the word of God have to say about spiritual gifts. So question for you today. Why did you come to church today? Why do you come to church every day or every Sunday? Some of you are hurting. Some of you are lonely. Some of you are seeking. Some of you are doing well right now. I mean, we praise God for that. Some of you are spiritually thirsty. Lisa, can you bring my water? Sorry. Just reminded me. I'll need that. And some of you, I, I'll put myself here. Some of you are just plain tired. Thank you. Some of you are just plain tired. When you go through those questions, were you thinking about the person next to you? Or are you thinking about yourself? I'm not saying this judging. When I heard that, this is the beginning of, a, of another message that I heard from someone. Right away, we think about ourselves. That's natural. It's okay. Um, but God has given us these spiritual gifts, specifically with the purpose of us thinking about the person sitting next to you. Thinking about your brothers and sisters in Christ here in the local church. And so we want to as we go through this topic of spiritual gifts, we want to go through it with the mindset of it's for other people, not just for ourselves. Now, now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes we are going to be hurting. We're going to be in a difficult spot and we do need to be ministered to. And there is a time and a place for that. But too often we get in this mindset. I know I do where, what can I get out of it? What, what can I get out of church? So why did you come to church today? We're looking at spiritual gifts. And as I mentioned, it's going to be very informative. We're not going to be looking at long passages of scripture, but I would like to read this because this is a key passage when we talk about spiritual gifts and what the Apostle Paul wrote uh, regarding spiritual gifts. So 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom, and to another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the, by the one spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So when we talk about this, why we do what we do, what do we believe here at Fifth Avenue Chapel? Many people have asked that. A few people have asked that specifically as I'm preparing for this message. Here's a, um, just a screenshot of our bylaws. And so what our bylaws say, and I'll just mention this point E, in our statement of doctrine and practices, in the what we believe section, we talk about the Holy Spirit indwells every believer and 
the Holy Spirit's ministries involve, jump down to letter E there, giving and controlling spiritual gifts for worship and service in the church. And this is the controversial one that more people have asked me about. The miracle gifts were only for the authentication of the infant church and are not for today. So that's our position. That's the position of many evangelicals, New Testament churches today. Um, but there are other thoughts on that. But that's where we stand as a chapel. So about a month ago, we talked about this idea of priesthood of all believers. I just wanted to mention this as a reminder. God has given us uh, this idea of priesthood. If we're a follower of Christ, if we've accepted Christ as our Savior, we have a privileged position for a particular purpose. But now here's the next layer. This is the, the, the next point, the next topic we want to consider in terms of us being priests. God has given us a spiritual gift, this providential provision, and it's for a particular purpose. But there's also specific guidelines in scripture. And then I want to end our time. I promise we'll make sure we have time for a personal provocation, for a challenge to each of us when we think of this topic of spiritual gifts. So we'll jump right into it. The first thing, and we're going to be referencing scripture a lot. Again, we're not necessarily going to be turning to scripture, but we're going to be referencing scripture because that's where we want to start from. That we want to be our blueprint. How are spiritual gifts distributed? For one, we know they're given by God. We can't earn it, achieve it. You, you can't get it at a Christian college or it can't be passed on from your parents or from another believer. It's given by God. And it's given to every believer in Jesus Christ. We'll, we'll mention that a few times today. It's given at the Holy Spirit's discretion. So you can't say, oh, well, I want that gift. I'm gonna talk, we're going to mention the gifts here. I, no, I want this. I'd prefer to have this gift. No, it's given at the Holy Spirit's discretion. We don't get to decide which spiritual gift we receive. No one person is given all the gifts. And that's the idea I had in the last slide, Dr. Larry Dixon mentioned about there's no such thing as an omnicompetent pastor where a leader of a church can have all the gifts and provide everything that a church needs. We are all given the gifts to serve one another and to build up the church. No one person is given all the gifts. We're all parts of one body. Some Christians have multiple gifts. I believe most people would agree with that. And also this is a point to, to uh, keep in mind no specific gift, like tongues is one that's often pointed to, is given to every follower of Christ. We're saying, hey, this gift is the next level of spiritual maturity. There's no biblical support for that. That's one of many gifts. So what are the spiritual gifts? I stole this from uh, our Sunday night series that we did with Dr. Dixon when we were looking at the Holy Spirit. And a good way to remember, you have two chapter 12s and two chapter 4s, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Those are kind of our big passages when we're looking at spiritual gifts. And then we have Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4 has two verses that mention these spiritual gifts. We elevate some, we lift some up, and some are, are, are more hidden, kind of like Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, where there's parts of the bodies that, that, that aren't as public, that, that aren't kind of in, in the face of everything, but they're still just as important. So we, we mention these gifts, and um, Lisa mentioned as I was going through this, you know, you're going to talk about these, right? I said, unfortunately, for the sake of time, we're not going to break down each of these gifts. We're kind of laying a foundation here. We want to have a, a general, this is how we approach spiritual gifts here at Fifth Avenue Chapel. We want to look at it from a biblical perspective. This, we really could take a Sunday night series or take a few months going through the spiritual gifts. But I just want you to see those to say, hey, these are some of the, the, the spiritual gifts that we're talking about. And here's where you can find them in scripture. So what are the purposes of the spiritual gifts? We're going to throw them all out here. Right now. Ephesians 4 gives us a lot of information, seven points of the purpose of spiritual gifts. And this is so important for us to recognize because today many people will say, well, the spiritual gift, I'm going to use it, but it, it's not used for the purpose that the spirit gave, gave it to us for. So Ephesians tells us the purpose of spiritual gifts is to equip the saints. I'm going to run down the list here. It's for the building up the, of the body of Christ, to attain the unity of faith, to attain the knowledge of the son of God, to maturity, to no longer be deceived, to grow up in Christ, and then in other passages, the purpose of spiritual gifts is to serve one another, to glorify God through Jesus Christ, for the common good, to care for one another, to build up the church, to instruct others, and let all things be done for building up. So these are the purposes that we see in scripture from Paul's writings, from Peter's writing, that we have why the spirit gave us these gifts for the church. And I try to sum this all up in my mind. And if you take anything home today, when we're talking about spiritual gifts, I believe this is the best way to summarize it. I thought this kind of covered all of our points here. 
Spiritual gifts are given for the glorification of Christ, not man, and for the building up of the church, not me. Keep that in mind as we go through. I know we have a lot of words today, but if you can, write this down. Spiritual gifts are given. When we look at the word of God, spiritual gifts are given for the glorification of Christ, not man, and for the building up of the church, not me. So we have the purpose. Now we also want to think about some biblical guidelines for the use of these spiritual gifts. I like this quote. I was listening to a few messages from our brother, Randy Amos, who passed away this past year. Um, he said, we need guidelines, especially when it comes to spiritual gifts. We need guidelines because, without, because power without control can hurt you. We just had the brakes in our van replaced yesterday. You press that gas pedal, that van's a six cylinder. It can move. It's got a lot of power to it. If that steering's not right, if those brakes aren't right, you can be hurt. Same thing with spiritual gifts. There's a lot of power in terms of what the spirit enables us to do. But unless, we're, uh, unless we have those guidelines to keep us in the right place, we can be hurt. We can do a lot of damage here in the local church. We can do a lot of damage to our spiritual lives. Power without control can hurt you. There are biblical guidelines for the use of spiritual gifts. One thing that's interesting, I'll throw all these up here for you right away. You saw those passages for spiritual gifts, right? First Corinthians 12 through 14 or 12, um, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, surrounding those lists of spiritual gifts and how they're to be used in the church. There's so much emphasis on humility and love. Look at Romans 12, 9 through 21. I love those passages. It's very practical. How we as Christians should be living among each other. How we as Christians should be treating one another. These are all right before and right after these lists of spiritual gifts. So it's not just, oh, well, here's the spiritual gifts and we know it, great, let's charge ahead. There's certain, uh, there's certain biblical guidelines in terms of how we should be using them. So again, with humility, with love, and then 1 Corinthians 14, we'll spend some time with, with our minds and should always be done with order. We need to remember these things because today, a lot of these spiritual gifts or people claiming to have these spiritual gifts, they're not done with any of these. There's a quote from a UCLA coach, a um, famous bas college basketball coach. He said, it isn't what you do, but how you do it. And we've been talking with our girls a lot this past year. It's not necessarily the position we take as Christians, although that's very, very important, but how do we go about that position? One example, I was talking to Johnny about, um, I, I could be pro-life. Great. I believe that's a biblical, uh, there, there's no question in my mind, but just because I take that position doesn't mean that no, no matter what I do in the name of pro-life is God honored. We have to be thinking about how we go about the use of spiritual gifts. Are we doing it in a biblically and God honoring way? So this is one that a few people asked me about. I committed to, this is going to be the challenge, 10 minutes. I'm going to try to spend 10 minutes or less on this idea of the miracle gifts or the sign gifts. Do they continue today? Maybe 12 minutes. Um, when we talk about a continuationist, because I'm going to throw that term out there, a continuationist would be someone who believes that these sign gifts, these miracle gifts, continue today, that they're in use today. And we talk about a cessationist, the idea of ceasing means that, that um, and that's where we as Fifth Avenue Chapel would, would put ourselves, if you had to put ourselves in one category, cessationists believe that these gifts don't necessarily continue today, at least not like they did in the early church. So, Again, there's the position of Fifth Avenue Chapel. And I said a personal disclaimer, but I believe most here would agree. We're not going to limit God and say, hey, God doesn't heal today. God can't do miraculous things in terms of language. I think we'd all agree. It's not our place to say God can't do this. We, we, we can't say that about God. He's God, right? But our belief is that these aren't gifts that God gives to individuals to be practiced on a regular basis. That those were specific gifts that were set aside for the establishment of the early church. And we're going to get into some of those details. I italicize prophecies because sometimes it depends on how you define prophecies. Some people say, well, we're telling the future. And others would say, well, no, it's a fourth telling of God's word, a warning for God's people. So that one's a, a little more gray. But we're gonna get into this. I got 11 minutes here. Support for continuations. I am so thankful for a friend. He said he's gonna listen to this message uh, later. A friend who considers himself a continuationist. I'm so thankful for a conversation, conversations we've had, but this past week, just talking for about an hour about his position on things and where he stands on things. Some scripture that's used, and this isn't just from, this is from research and the last few weeks. 
some scriptures that continuationists would use. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Unfortunately, that can be taken to an extreme and we can say, oh, there's freedom. Well, then anything goes. Well, if we look at God's word, we know that's not the case. Earnestly desire the higher gifts or the greater gifts. Many people say, well, that means we should all seek the gift of tongues or we should all seek the gift of, of prophecies. But the argument with that would be that was written to the church at Corinth. It wasn't written to each individual. It was written as a church. We want you to desire these gifts that will build up the church. And then this, this statement, this is one that I've heard uh, frequently. Uh, Ephesians 5.18 talks about being filled with the spirit. And the translation there is to be full of, to actually be overflowing with the spirit. And so a lot of times a continuationist would say, well, then, you know, it really needs to be evident. We need to be showing. Uh, and it can become this emotional experience. Um, and, and we want to make sure that it's not just an emotional experience. When we look at God's word, those who are filled with the spirit were filled with joy. They were given boldness in declaring God's word. So that's how we at Fifth Avenue would say, yes, the spirit is powerful. We don't want to ignore that. Um, but it's for a purpose, for the building up of the church, for the glorification of Christ. And then here's one. And I'd say this is something that we really do need to consider. Uh, and, he did, uh, and he did not do many works there because of their unbelief. And a statement that is often made is it's because of a lack of faith that we don't see these sign gifts today. And I believe lack of faith can be an issue among believers today. I think if we're honest, uh, that, that is an issue. But I don't know if we can necessarily say, well, that's why we don't see these gifts today. So those are some statements that, that you might see from a continuationist or cessationist. We also have to understand that there's a spectrum. Just like we talk about Calvinism, Armenianism, there's an extreme cessationist, an extreme continuationist. We have a challenge. as If you call yourself a cessationist, and, and I would call myself that, out of fear of going too far one way, I could go too far the other way. We do this. This is human nature, right? Out of fear of, well, I don't want to be like that. So I'm going to run in the other direction. And we can't, Dr. Dixon made a very good point on our Sunday night series. We can't ignore the power of the spirit. The spirit, the Holy Spirit is given to us as believers. Spiritual gifts should be used. We, we should have boldness and joy and, and a supernatural ability that God gives to serve in the church, to serve one another. I like this illustration. I think when we think, when I think the extreme continuationist viewpoint, I guess in your screen, it's up here, um, is I think of a kid uh, hitting, hitting the baseball or, you know, just learning how to play baseball and saying they're so focused on getting the ball, they hit it, but then they forget to run to first base. They're so excited. Their, their focus is on the means. The goal of the game is to get on base and to score a goal, right? We, that's the end of the game. But we can be so focused on, well, I hit the ball and, and, and forget, oh, I need to run to first. And so I look at that illustration where we can be so focused on the spiritual gifts that we forget, well, what's the purpose of the spiritual gifts? That's not the end. Practicing the spiritual gifts, that's not the end of what we're supposed to do. That's a means to glorify Christ. That's a means to lead people to Christ. That's a means to build up the church, to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ. So just the, the, that helps me kind of think about it. But again, I don't want to run so far from that direction, I'm just ignoring the Spirit's work in my life and in the, the church here at Fifth Avenue Chapel. So we want to be careful. Again, we want to have a biblical approach to this. This is where I'm not going to be able to share everything, but I am happy to share my PowerPoint slide with you because I, I, I have trouble. I want to put everything out there, and I just don't have time to share it. But when we, talk, when we think about apostles, I think it's very helpful to look at the history of this. We're not, we don't have time for that. But at least biblical criteria for apostles. And we say, does this apply to today? And unfortunately, as many people are self-appointed apostles. And it can be something, it can be very dangerous because it's unchecked authority a lot of times. But the biblical criteria for apostles was an apostle had to be a physical eyewitness of the risen Christ. An apostle had to be personally appointed by Christ. An apostle, an apostle had to be able to authenticate his apostleship with miraculous signs. And again, that's why we believe these miraculous signs were given for the early church to authenticate an apostle's apostleship. And again, apostles are for the foundation of the early church. I did want to read this scripture, Ephesians 2, 19 to 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So again, why our position would be the apostles and the prophets, that the focus was on the foundation of the early church. 
And here's some other points, again, for the sake of time, we won't dig into these, but why we believe that um, this gift of apostleship does not continue today. Canon of scripture is closed. The post-apostolic church was led specifically by elders and deacons. We see an emphasis on the elders and deacons and not so much on the apostles as time goes on. Um, another thing about the walls in, the, in New Jerusalem, we can't get into that. Uh, and then this, this thought, this reminder, apostles and prophets, they still equip saints today through the word of God. So we don't want to forget that. We will keep moving. And I know this is fast. When we talk about healings, again, I think it's important to understand kind of the, the history, uh, the background of a lot of these, um, these movements. Oral Roberts, many of you may have heard with March Madness, they were the Cinderella team this year. Um, they were the 15 seed. I think they beat Ohio State and Florida. And um, I said, well, let me look. You're like you start hearing things, Oral Roberts. Oh, a Christian school. We do some research and well, this Oral Roberts, he was the godfather of the charismatic movement. His life verse was 3 John 2. I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. And his whole push was the seed faith giving. That was his kind of um, creation, this word of faith movement. And he really partnered that with the, with the prosperity gospel. And his popularity exploded in the 1950s, specifically through TV, through television programs. He would have these healing services. And you can look up online. There's a lot of alumni from Oral Roberts University. And you see how some of their teaching and some of their practices line up with this more um, continuationist, this more extreme continuationist position. But again, we need to go back to scripture when we look at healings. The biggest challenge is that we, we might disagree on, well, does God give this as a gift? But we need to look at what are some biblical guidelines for how we go about a gift of healing if someone claims to have it. I think there's six or seven things here. New Testament healings did not depend on the faith of the recipient. We look at that and yes, salvation and forgiveness of sins 100% was dependent on the faith of the recipient. But a lot of times people were healed. They didn't even know who Jesus was. New Testament healings were not performed for money or fame. A lot of times Jesus said, don't say a word about this. He wasn't looking for the fame. New Testament healings were always 100% completely successful. No question. New Testament healings were undeniable, especially from doubters and skeptics. New Testament healings were immediate and spontaneous. And this is a big one for me. New Testament healings authenticated a true message. So many times today we have people that claim the gift of healing, but it's very often, almost always when I've seen it, partnered with this false gospel, whether it's prosperity gospel, whatever the teaching might be. And that's an issue to, to me. That makes it easier for me to say, okay, I can't listen to this person or we can't go this direction because what they're teaching is not a biblical gospel. And we, again, need to get back to the word. And we say, is what they're teaching truth from God's word? Is the gospel they're teaching the true gospel? The true gospel doesn't call us to say, oh, all your problems are going away. God's going to heal all your diseases. No, the true gospel calls us to share in Jesus' sufferings, to follow in his steps, and to suffer for doing good. And this is probably the biggest issue for me in terms of the, the whole topic of healing. I'm just going to read this. Many faith healers take all the credit for the success stories. They take all the money too. Um, but they remain immune from any blame for failures as they are typically attributed to a lack of faith by the one seeking healing. You may have friends, I have friends who've been told your baby, I know the situation doesn't look good, but you just have, to have enough faith and God's gonna do a miracle and heal your baby. And the baby doesn't survive. And well, that's on you, you didn't have enough faith. And that's a very dangerous road to go down. We have to be extremely careful with that type of mentality. Prophets, I like this comic here. The wolf found that the shepherd's clothing worked even better. And so here's some warnings about false teachers. The word of God has some of the harshest criticism, the harshest words for those who claim I have a special revelation from God and then it ends up not being true. The punishment for a lot of the false prophets, at least in the Old Testament, was death. Imagine we had that same uh, standard today. I think we'd have a few less uh, false teachers out there. But again, back to the word. Let's go back to the word. Three biblical criteria for identifying false teachers. Any self-proclaimed prophet who leads people into false doctrine, any self-proclaimed prophet who lives in unrestrained lust and unrepentant sin. Again, maybe you're not so sure about this idea, the, the, the gift of prophecy, but if their lifestyle doesn't line up with the word of God, then that makes it easier for me to decide. I can't be following this person. And then any self-proclaimed prophet who speaks a revelation from God, 
that ends up untrue. We also need to remember, and again, I appreciate my friends so much. We might have a different position on whether gifts continue or whether they cease, but we both agree in that conversation. Any prophecy or teaching that is not consistent with scripture must be rejected. That's plain and simple. Any prophecy or teaching that is not consistent with scripture must be rejected. You look at Jeremiah 23, 16, where God's people were told to reject the words of the prophet, their own prophets, if they spoke a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. And then we believe in the sufficiency of scripture, that God does truly speak through his word today. The word of God is living. It is powerful. As our brother John shared this morning, people were pierced. Their, their heart was pricked. The word of God should do that to us today. And for the sake of time, we'll keep moving. Again, I think it's important to understand the history. We won't go through the history of the, this, this um, apostolic faith movement, which um, Charles Parham said was the new Pentecost. But a foundational passage that John read from this morning was Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, it's clear when we talk about tongues, it clearly states that the tongues spoken were a specific translatable language. That has been twisted to mean something else today, especially in the last 50 years, in the last 100 years. There is a command that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians for an interpreter multiple times. It needs to be some translatable language. And this was a point that I found just in, in some of my research. I thought this was very interesting. Just to keep this in mind, and, and you can make what you want. We can talk about this later. But in Genesis 11, we read at the Tower of Babel, God brought confusion to the people as a judgment for sin. The result of their sin, God brings confusion. On the day of Pentecost, it was the opposite. God brought understanding for the spread of the gospel. It was God showing his grace, God giving this gift to bring understanding. So look at that contrast. When there's confusion, when there's chaos, if you go into a place and it's not order and it's just, it's craziness, it's chaos. We have to take a second and say, is this of God? Because we're told specifically, especially in the passages about the spiritual gifts that God is a God of order. Things are be, to be done in an orderly way. At the Tower of Babel, God brought confusion to the people. That was a judgment for sin. On the day of Pentecost, God brought understanding and communication. Also, we need to keep in mind, there's no biblical basis for the claim that speaking in tongues indicates a higher level of spiritual maturity. This is an easy one for me. The Corinthians were all baptized in the Holy Spirit, but not all had the gift of tongues. And I think you can just, that, that speaks for itself. And spiritual gifts are all given again by the Spirit's independent prerogative. I can't say, well, I need to seek that gift of tongues. The Spirit gives as he pleases. This idea, we don't have time to get into it, but when the perfect comes, and many people disagree on, well, when is that perfect? When is that maturity? Is it the finishing of the word of God? Is it in eternity? Um, this is something, another time, basically a, another discussion for another time. But we're told at some point, tongues and prophecies will cease. That could be in eternity. That could be, you know, with the close of scripture. That is, is a longer conversation. But Paul's emphasis in that 1 Corinthians 13, his emphasis was that the showy gifts that the Corinthians desired, they would indeed end but love would endure. And again, getting back to the biblical guidelines for the use of these spiritual gifts to be done in love and to be done with humility. And this 1 Corinthians 14, I believe, is probably one of the most neglected chapters for anybody who does say, hey, I believe that the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy continues today. I think we tend to, to ignore what 1 Corinthians 14 says. And so whether or not you disagree with someone you're talking with, with a friend, or maybe you believe this, maybe you believe that, you know, the gift of tongues is in use today, well, then I just encourage you, go to 1 Corinthians 14, sit down, read it, and just check the practice, the exercise of that gift with God's word, with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. First of all, that whole chapter is basically Paul arguing that prophecy is greater than tongues. He says, any distinct sound or un unintelligible speech is useless. He writes, the speech must be a translatable tongue, not mindless. So again, with the mind, in order. He writes, tongues are a sign for unbelievers. So that's something I think we miss very often. Tongues was used for unbelievers to, to have the gospel spread to those who, who spoke a different language. And many times we see it being abused and misused in the church today. And again, we're reminded that the worship must be orderly. So 1 Corinthians 14, again, depending on your position, um, 
I don't believe this is a salvation issue. It can get to that if we start partnering these continuation gifts with, with false gospels and, and, you know, messages that aren't from God's word. But, um, but I encourage you, um, no matter where you stand on this, turn to 1 Corinthians 14 and say, hey, let me look at what I believe. Does it fall in line with the guidelines that God puts forth in his word? And just in case you had any doubt, I, I think um, Paul puts on his dad voice here. I said, I got to put this here. Don't make me use my dad voice. At the end of this chapter, if you have any concerns, well, maybe Paul is just suggesting things here, or maybe he's, you know, just has an idea. This is maybe how it should go. No. Paul says, just in case you didn't understand, did the word of God come from you? This is a command from the Lord, this 1 Corinthians 14. And even before that, but specifically at the end of 1 Corinthians 14, he writes, and he says, remember, he says it again, remember, all should be done decently and in order. When we think about spiritual gifts, we need to keep that in mind. In talking with my friend this week, the conversation came up. And again, I am going to have to jump through these, but I will share this with you. But I just want to show you this screen. When we talk about spiritual gifts, we need to make sure that we are not elevating spiritual experience over biblical truth. It is so important for us. Our experience, our hearts are deceitfully wicked. We're told in Jeremiah 17, 9, our hearts can tell us a lot of different things. The word of God, we believe here at Fifth Avenue Chapel, it's an authority for us. It's unchanging. It's God's word to us. It's the truth. And so we need to make sure we're not elevating experience over truth. And so here, especially in the 1960s and the 1970s, you see the rise of many of these um, modes of thought. And it also coincided with the rise of this charismatic shift that, got in, that really spread into many mainstream groups and denominations. And the prosperity gospel, all these things rose with this idea of, well, truth is relative. You determine your truth, I determine my truth. That experience is elevated over biblical truth. And we can't do that. Here at Fifth Avenue Chapel, the word of God is our authority. For many today, the narrowed focus on spiritual gift or experiencing um, that, that, that spiritual gift, that's the emphasis. And then we run to scripture to try to defend what we just experienced. Rather than, let me look at the word of God and let that be my foundation. Let that be my guideline. We must remember the purpose of and the biblical guidelines for spiritual gifts. And we must honestly evaluate, not simply try to justify our experience based on the unchanging truths of God's word. Again, our hearts can deceive us. Our hearts can pull us different ways. God's word does not change. And I'll just mention these three points here. We at Fifth Avenue believe the sign and miracle gifts have ceased because they were for the establishment of the early church. They were for the verification of the true word from God, especially early on before we had the full and complete scriptures. And then this is one that would involve more conversation when the perfect, when the complete or mature comes tongues and prophecies will cease at some point. So that's a lot. I just threw a lot at you. We got about 10 minutes left here. I want to simplify it, kind of bring it back to us. And how do we approach this now? We think about spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit has certain ministries when we look at God's word. And again, our Sunday night series with Dr. Dixon, I love. There's certain ministries and we'll list them out here to glorify Christ. And there's probably one or two more, but these are the main ones that come to mind. The Holy Spirit's ministries are to glorify Christ, to give power to the believer, to guide into all truth, to comfort and help, to teach and remind, to convict the world of sin, and to bring assurance of salvation for believers. When we look at the spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit uses those gifts in us to accomplish some of these ministries. And so we want to be aware of that. And then another simple way of, I, I, I like asking questions. If we can say, here's five questions. Jonathan Edwards used this. Others have used this questionnaire from 1 John 4, 2 to 8. Questions we can ask, say, well, is this of the Lord? And this doesn't necessarily have to apply just to spiritual gifts, but is something of God? Is it truly the Holy Spirit? There's five questions we can ask, and we should ask. Does it exalt the true Christ? Does it oppose worldliness or promote holiness and promote holiness? Does it point people to scriptures or does it say, no, no, don't look at scripture. We, we're going to ignore that. Does it point people to scriptures? Does it elevate truth? And does it produce love for God and for others? Again, getting back to those biblical guidelines. Is it surrounded in love? Does it look like love? Is it done in humility? These are very important questions we need to ask. 
So again, I will, this will be up on YouTube, but I can share this PowerPoint with, um, with, with those of you who are interested. So I wanna make sure we have time for our personal challenge, uh, something that we need to keep in mind. I know historically I've said, well, you know what? I don't believe this is a salvation issue. I, I don't know, is it foundational? Eh, it, it starts to get in that direction, but so then should I just kind of leave it alone? Do we make too much of this issue or maybe do we not make enough of it? We need to ask ourselves that. Lisa knows, she'll tell you. I like to get into it with people. I like to you know, disagree with people. This was a quote from a book, Strange Fire by John MacArthur. He comes at it very hard. And this is what my friend said. I agree with, with at least his stance on uh, the, the cessation of some of these gifts, but he does come very hard. I think he says the word charlatans like 70 times in the first half of the book. Right? He's very passionate about it. And sometimes people said he can maybe come across too hard without this love and humility that we're talking about. But he said, if God the Father or God the Son were mocked in this way, if lies were being told about Jesus or about God the Father, we would surely protest. Why should we be any less passionate for the glory and the honor of the Spirit? So he says, hey, we shouldn't just brush this issue to the side of spiritual gifts and the Holy Spirit. It is something we should take seriously. But again, this reminder, <clears throat> and we've learned it much this year. You might disagree with a lot of people. This is maybe a general truth we could take home with us today. Maybe um, they're a continuationist or they're a cessationist or wherever you stand, you stand opposite them. Maybe someone is pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine or pro-mask, anti-mask. Maybe they're a Red Sox fan. Whatever the reason, if you disagree with them, there are certain rules, biblical guidelines that we should approach these difficult conversations with. And again, I want this to be a start of a conversation. I, I would love talking about this. We talk for hours, but Brooklyn probably knows more about the spiritual gifts than she'd ever want to because she hears Lisa and I talking about it the last few weeks. How should we respond to anybody we disagree with? It should always be in love and with humility. It should be characterized by reason and order. It should be for the glorification of Christ, not man. And it should be for the building up of the body, not me. So keep those things in mind. We have a, a few more things. We, we want to look a little bit more here at the spiritual gifts, but at least as a general principle, I think that's something that we really could take home with us when we disagree with someone, especially in difficult conversations like this in love with humility, characterized by reason and order, for the glorification of Christ, not man, and for the building up of, of the body, not me. I'm not going to read this, but just these bold lines. While charismatics treat the Holy Spirit like an impersonal force of ecstatic energy, evangelicals often have generally reduced him to the caricature of a peaceful dove, often portrayed on Bible covers and bumper stickers, as if the spirit of the Almighty were a harmless white bird fluttering quietly in the breeze. This idea of, well, I want to avoid this extreme continuationist, this showy, sideshow, spiritual gifts, and I'm going to run too far the other way and ignore it. The Holy Spirit is living and powerful and wants to do a work through each of us. He's given every believer a spiritual gift to be used, again, for his glorification, for the building up of the church. Do we ignore that? Do we miss that? People want to see miracles today. They should stop following fake healers and start engaging in biblical evangelism. See the transformation that can happen in someone's life through the work of the Holy Spirit. To see a spiritually dead sinner made alive in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit is to witness an actual miracle of God. I appreciated this warning to, to all you cessationists out there, to where I would put myself as, you know, we had this warning, don't ignore the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's the challenge for us. In the last five minutes here, I just wanted to... Um, kind of bring it back to, you know, I know that's a lot that we threw at you. I know we ran through it fast, but I wanted to at least present that just to get our minds thinking about that, start a conversation. We have the Corinthian church that Paul writes, they were eager for the manifestations of the spirit. Are you eager for the gift of the spirit for the purpose of building up of the church? I think today, I'm convinced today, the American church has the opposite problem in general, um, or at least in our more conservative circles, if I could put it that way, we have the opposite problem that the Corinthians did. They earnestly desired, they were eager for the gifts of the spirit. And they might have the wrong reasons, but they were eager for those gifts. We look at the story in Matthew 25, 14 to 30. I think it's one that's familiar to many of us, the parable of the talents. And these were servants that were given five talents, two talents, and one talent. And 
the master goes away and, and then he comes back and he sees, well, what did you do with this? And a talent, I just wanna get my numbers right here. One talent I believe was the equivalent of about 20 years worth of wages. So let's put that in today's terms. Let's say $50,000 for an annual salary, a million dollars basically. That one talent was a million dollars. He could have put it in a savings account for 0.5% interest and got $5,000 back each year just for the money sitting in the savings account. Could have done something with it. No, he buried it. He did nothing with it. He ignored it, this talent that was given by the master. And what was the master's response? He said, you wicked and slothful servant. That's some harsh words. But if we put ourselves in the position of that servant, we've been given a spiritual gift to be used, to be exercised for the glorification of Christ, for the building up of the church, to be done with humility, to be done in love. And some of us are just ignoring it. Some of us aren't really that interested in what gift has God given me for others, to serve others, to give to others. So are you, and I'll put myself here, I'm asking myself these questions. Are we guilty of burying or ignoring this gift? Maybe those harsh words should be directed towards us, you wicked and slothful servant, if we're ignoring that gift. If we've trusted Christ as Savior, we've been given a spiritual gift. Do we know what that gift is? That's the first question. And the second is, have you been exercising that gift? And we talked about leadership here at Fifth Avenue Chapel. It's the leadership. It's our responsibility to provide opportunities for the exercise of those gifts. So we need to make sure we're aware of that. And please tell us, hey, how can I be involved? What can I do? How can I exercise this spiritual gift? If we don't provide opportunities as leadership, then we're failing the body. So that's an important thing. It, it, it's a two-way street. It's not, it's not just a one, well, what have you done? But we need to be seeking what is that gift and have we been exercising it? You may have heard of this book. We read it back in college. It's still on my big bookshelf. It's called Now Discover Your Strengths. So I just said, let me, let me change it to now discover your gifts. And now today, be thinking about this. If you don't know what your spirit, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you don't know what your spiritual gift is, be thinking about that. And there's five recommendations, very simple. I just want to leave you with here. Pray, understand it's a work of God, that God gives it to you. Pray that God would show you what your spiritual gift is and how you can exercise that for the building up of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Learn about spiritual gifts. This is just, this is a little, uh, just a teaser, if I could put it. You can't cover all this in, in 40 minutes, but learn about spiritual gifts. Get into God's word. Take a spiritual gift assessment. Later this week, I'm gonna be sending through the prayer email a, a link that you can click and this isn't a definitive, oh, that's my spiritual gift because the, the, the assessment told me, but at least to get you thinking about it. You go through, you answer 20 or 50 questions that says, hey, your spiritual gift might be this. Again, just to get us thinking about it. And then try it. Again, exercise the spiritual gift and ask for feedback. Don't just ask for feedback because I think a lot of us can do that, but listen to the feedback. Listen and say, okay, the people that know you best and say, well, Jim, you don't have the gift of teaching. I'm just going to be upfront with you. Or Jim, you don't have the gift of mercy. You know, like be honest, the people who know you best and we need to listen to that. We need, it, it's a humbling thing to say, what do you, it's probably easier to say, what, what do you know my spiritual gift is not? That might be easier. Start with that. It takes some things away. What do you think my spiritual gift is? Let's be talking about these things, maybe even over lunch today. So I go back to the question we started with and we'll close with this. Why did you come to church today? Many times I know I come with this mindset of, well, what can I, I need to be encouraged. And sometimes we need that. I'm not throwing that out. But when we come to church, let's think about the spiritual gifts that God has given us. He's given it again. I'll say it again, just as a reminder, for the glorification of Christ and for the building up of his church. Each and every one of us who has embraced God's free gift of salvation in the person and work of Christ, we're an essential part of the church. This picture here, you've probably seen it. Uh, I think it was a few months into COVID. It was from a Mexican newspaper. And I believe it was 198 healthcare workers who died, who gave their lives for a greater purpose, right? For fighting the, the issue of COVID. That was so, just such an issue and still an issue today. Well, we in the church, I think there's some parallels here where we have a greater purpose. We can um, be a part of this greater purpose in every single person. So this picture is a picture of every single uh, of those 198 healthcare workers at that time who died fighting COVID. Think of the church and you have a part to play. If you're missing out of this picture, then something's not right with that picture. We all have been given a spiritual gift and we all have a part to play. We're an essential part 
of the church. Again, each of us has given a gift for the glorification of Christ and for the building up of our brothers and sisters. So why did you come to church today? Let's see the big picture. We step back. It's not just, well, what can I get out of it? But how can I be a part of God's greater story? Using the spiritual gift that he has given me. And I'll end with this quote. I think it's challenging, not just for spiritual gifts, but I believe it does apply here. It's from a book by Francis Chan. What would your church, ask yourselves, think about this. What would your church and the worldwide church look like if everyone was as committed as you are? If everyone gave and served and prayed exactly like you, would the church be healthy and empowered or would it be weak and listless? God, our Father, we thank you for this topic of spiritual gifts. And there's so much to cover. Um, I know we, we kind of rushed through here, but I pray that that's something stuck today from your word, Father, not from my lips, but from your word. We thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit. We thank you that you've given us spiritual gifts. And many times in the busyness of life, we can <coughs> lose sight of the big picture. We can lose sight of what you've put us here for. We, we first of all, thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for the, the, the gift of salvation, for forgiveness of sins that comes so freely to us, but it's such a great cost to your son who gave everything for us. And we truly are pierced when we stop and we think, and we're reminded of what was accomplished for us on that cross. But now, Father, we pray, we ask that you would help us to not just be comfortable in that forgiven, uh, in, that, um, in that position that we have in Christ now, but that we might recognize that you've called us to be your ambassadors. You've called us to be an active part of the local church. And we know that you've given, your word has told us you've given us spiritual gifts. So we pray, Father, that you would help us to know what those gifts are, know what that gift is. But Father, also that we would be burdened to use it, to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ, to point people to Jesus, to, to lead souls um, to Christ. We thank you, Father, for the fact that your spirit is powerful, that we're indwelt by the spirit. We are sealed with the spirit. Um, we have assurance of salvation through the spirit. And Father, we pray that we would not neglect the Holy Spirit and these spiritual gifts that you've given us. We pray, Father, that you would just guide us into all truth, that we would be looking to your word for purpose, that we would be looking to your word for guidelines in terms of how we go about this Christian life. And, and Father, help us to always remember that everything we do within the walls of this church, within our communities, at our workplace, that it would be done in love, that it would be done with humility, and that all that we do would be honoring to you. We give you thanks, Father. Uh, for the salvation you give us. We give you thanks for the Holy Spirit, which indwells us. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.